Elderwood Academy are artisans who craft amazing gaming products, including dice towers, dice trays, dice boxes, deck boxes, dice, and more. All products are crafted to look like spell books, scroll cases, codexes, and other awesome fantasy gear. I've mentioned before that I'm not a big dice and dice accessories type of person. I admit I have never used a dice tray or a dice tower, but maybe those things are your jam. Well, let me introduce you to Elderwood's Codex, the arcane crafted dice tower designed to look and act as a scroll case. The magic of Codex starts with a decorative hardwood caps and is handsomely wrapped in foil press leather. The Codex caps are firmly engaged with rare earth magnets and feature twist off designs to open both at the top and the bottom, turning your scroll case into the dice tower it was meant to be. You can check out the Codex and all the options at elderwoodacademy.com forward slash don't split. This is Tabletop Babble, and I'm Amber. Today on the show, I talk with Game Master and comedian Brennan Lee Mulligan. His passion and excitement for playing and running games is incredibly infectious, and it was an absolute pleasure chatting with him. We sat down on November 19th and he gave me advice about running D&D, shared what it's like to GM a high production game for a show, and his three proudest GM moments. Hi, thank you so much for coming on the show today, Brennan. A, 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 a yeah. dang delight to be here, Amber. Thank you so much for having me, truly. I'm uh, very looking forward yeah. to it. This is awesome. Yes, I'm so happy too. I'm so excited. So for my listeners, would you please let them know who you are and what you do in the TTRPG space. Uh, hello, listeners. My name is Brennan Lee Mulligan. I am the uh, host and dungeon master of Dimension 20, which is an actual play show run by College Humor for their streaming service, Dropout. I've been playing tabletop since I was 10 years old. I've been running games since I was 10 years old. I am an improv comedian. I was trained at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. I also was the head writer for a LARP camp for many years uh, called The Wayfinder Experience. And in a bizarre twist of fate, became a professional dungeon master while working for College Humor as a cast member there doing sketch comedy. What a wild world. I was going to say, that's an amazing journey. So 10 years old is when yes. you started playing Dungeons and Dragons specifically? Yeah, 10 years old, D&D specifically. My wonderful mom, an incredible writer named Elaine Lee, uh, who was a comic book author. You know, I was 10 years old. I had just been pulled out of public school because I was getting the crap kicked out of me so frequently. You know, if you bring an animal fact file book to recess and hide under a picnic table to read it. The other children will not take kindly to discovering that you have done this, um, uh, uh, not to endorse what they did, but to just say like, hey, uh, causality, right? Um, so uh, so uh, I was taken out uh, into homeschooling um, and my mom was basically like, we gotta find stuff for Bren to, you know, find an outlet and ha make friends and et cetera, et cetera. And heroically, because she was very much in these nerd spaces as a uh, creator of Starstruck and a awesome comics author, knew about D&D &D from those, those worlds being so intertwined and basically put up a little flyer in our local game store. Uh, shout out to LGSs, you know, especially during COVID times, make sure to support your LGS, support your local gaming store. And put up a flyer, said, I have a 10-year-old son who I'm looking for a game with. And a group of 20-somethings in an act of generosity so baffling that I truly don't understand it, just out of the kindness of their hearts, were like, yes, we will share this. Because, you know, D&D &D and a lot of those very complex, crunchy tabletop games, they are like sourdough. Like, you need a starter. It's hard to just pick up the books and get started. So uh, was taught the game, gained some degree of very wobbly proficiency with it, and then absconded to my own little group of 10-year-old friends and began running games and never looked back. That's amazing. I, I love that. I also was pulled out of public school uh, and didn't have quite as cool as a mom uh, as you did, but we also had like in our church, uh, surprisingly, a weird place to get D&D &D from. 
uh, had a group of people, 30-somethings, who were also kind and generous enough to be like, hey, tabletop role-playing games, try it out. But I didn't, you started GMing when you were that age as well? Yes, here's the thing. I think I dodged the bullet by like two years. And by that, I mean, I think 10 is still childlike enough, or at least it was for me, I was a very late bloomer, that that kind of tween age self-doubt, like the horrible doubt monster, had not crept into my head yet. So at 10, I think if I had discovered the game at 12, very different story. I think I would be like, oh, I'm awkward. I don't, how do I do this? But 10 year old Brennan was like, well, yeah, I get it. There's dice, you add numbers, cool. I got it. Let me, let me, you know, like, let me take a whack at this. And started so that by the time I got into those awkward teenage years, there was a weight of precedent of having already ran the game that sort of just propelled me on to continue running it. Which is, again, one of those weird things when people ask, like, which I think in some ways has made me, you know, we have like Adventuring Academy, which is like a podcast we do about advice for the game. And I always kind of critique myself in my head in giving advice about running the game because sometimes people will be like, what do you do about nerves when you're DMing for the first time? And I will try to give good advice, but the advice that I used in my life was B10. And that's not... <laughs> that's not that time where machine, is where is it? Uh, so, you know, realizing that not every journey there is the same way and that the journey I went on, that path is not available to people unless they are 10. Gosh, because I was going to ask that. I was going to I was going to ask you, I have to come clean. I've played D&D for seven years. I started at 3.5 and a little bit of 4E and I've been GMing now for four-ish years, but not D&D &D ever. And I'm kind of oh. hesitant to do it. And so I was gonna ask you, Brennan, what would be your advice? I'm kind of intimidated by the system. Okay, cool. Now that, I'm, I, I won't lie, that is uh, a very fascinating question because I don't know if I've ever spoken to someone that had GM experience under their belt and played D&D, &D, but had not run D and D. That is that's a very interesting Venn diagram of like experiences within the tabletop space. Can I ask what you have GM'd? I started out doing a lot of indie one shot, like one page things, because I was more worried about my improv skills and like kind of being on the fly and learning to let go of things. So a the system that I've run the most right now is this. Um, TTRPG, uh, it's a Japanese RPG called Ryutama. It's, I describe it as a Oregon Trail meets a Studio Ghibli film. <gasps> it's really cute and it has like things I love like resource management, cute little dragons, that kind of stuff. It has a very light feel to it. It's all mm -hmm. about traveling. Um, so that's my most experience. And then other Powered by the Apocalypse games like The Warren, which is everybody plays as rabbits. I love that. What I would say is, and I can never tell, I, I'm always very cognizant of weighing in on a topic from a bad perspective. Like anytime I tell people like, it's easy. It's like, is it Brennan? Is it easy? Did you, or, or is, it, is it just so in your bones at this point? That being said, uh, it's easy. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, no, but like that being <laughs> said, the way I feel about this is the hard part of DMing is the part that it sounds like you're already good at. If you are comfortable in more, you know, I don't know if you said like necessarily lyric games, but if you're more comfortable in freeform improvisation in collaborative storytelling and you've been playing D, D for years as a player the amount of puzzle pieces that are missing for you are uh, less than a handful right like like yeah what, like the things that are going to be unfamiliar for you are like what like tracking initiative you know like running a monster stat block yeah I think that's what I think that is like maybe it would help to understand why I'm intimidated and maybe also if any of my listeners have also been intimidated by D&D &D, you know that crunchy system a lot of information to hold when I have an ADHD brain 
or like trying to organize information. So that's obviously, well, there's, there's obviously, I think there's two different things here. One of them is, are you someone who's going to have fun running D and D? And that's a very different question of, can you, I think, can you is immediately answerable and it's a yes, you can like you played the game, you have GM skills. There's not too much in your way. The other question is, is D and D a system that you're going to have fun running? I, it's, which is, I think it's bizarre for some people to hear because I obviously have an improv background and love storytelling. I also love the tedious numerical upkeep of optimizing a character. The, it's just two different tracks in my brain and I love it. When people go like, you know, like, like what, you know, D&D has all this like, incredible numerical weight and the mechanics are so complex. To me, it's like, yeah, peanut butter and jelly, like two great tastes that taste great together. I love role playing and I love numbers. This is going to be dope as hell, right? Um, but if that's not your steez, then so be it, right? Uh, but I think it's a very different realization than can I do? I think absolutely you could. I, I have a very weird relationship with encouragement. I used to be an improv teacher and I would have people come up and be like, I'm worried about being good at improv. And, and, uh, and after the first like, couple months of being like, you're going to be great at improv, it started weighing on me for some reason. And I started changing what my encouragement was. And I started saying, if this isn't fun, don't do it. And I think that there's actually something more freeing in that, where it's like, if someone's like, I, I, I'm worried about D&D, because I, I, what I always want to say is like, you can do this, but if you don't like it, do something else. I don't want to give you this encouraging message of like, Amber, you need to go run D&D &D because you're going to be great at it. And if you're not great at it or it feels bad, keep trying, keep having a bad time and do it forever. Nuts to that, we say, right? Th things that are games should be fun. Now, that being said, let me say something else that I think is a different kind of encouraging here. Nobody, nobody, nobody runs a rules perfect D and D campaign. If you run an eighty session campaign, if you run a hundred session campaign, you blew a rule somewhere. Someone didn't add the hit points right. Someone forgot concentration. Someone did something somewhere that slipped. What I will say about the robustness of Dungeons and Dragons, right, is that a lot of rules have to get broken before the story doesn't make sense anymore. Let's say we mess up concentration during a battle. We forgot to do concentration checks when spellcasters took, well, I guess they just succeeded on their checks. Wasn't it always possible that they could succeed? And then if you want to, you go like, yeah, something about the nature of this battle, I was, had a very strong hold on my magic. Someone forgets to mark down hit points correctly. I guess that wound was a little bit worse or not as bad. That basically, I think that the concern and worry about the rules system forgets that to the degree that the rules of D&D &D are simulating this fictional fantastical reality, you're not gonna ever mess up the rules so bad that your story doesn't make sense anymore. And if that's the case, then everyone should be able to breathe easy and go, you know, like not to bring it to current events, but even in the election stuff that we're, you know, talking about now, there's this whole thing of like election fraud. And it's like, yeah, 150 million people aren't gonna vote perfect. The question is, so yes, there was fraud. There were like five instances of fraud not enough to overturn a county, let alone a state, let alone the election. So I think that people need to grasp that D&D is an enormous system. You are going to have rules slip ups. That's going to be okay. They're almost never going to be severe enough to have changed the outcome of X or Y. Or if they would have changed an outcome, cool. Does, is the story able to accommodate that difference in the rules? If the story is surviving, then great, we're all good. So what I'm hearing is if I try it at least once, see if I have fun, if I enjoy it, two, be forgiving because we're human and we can only yeah. keep so much in our brain, and then three, go back in time and kidnap my 10-year-old self and interrogate them and make them remember how to be a 10-year-old. Amber, if you could come around with me in my real life to summarize what it takes me hours and hours to say, I'm the least <laughs> succinct... <laughs> Brevity is the soul of wit, and baby, I got none, okay? 
Yes. They, yeah, that's a perfect summary. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. I got it. I got it. Um. So I. Okay. So GMing versus playing. I want to know. Do you enjoy one more than the other? <sighs> Fascinating Ooh. question. If you had asked a different question, the answer would have been quick, which is if you were to ask me, which would I rather do more? The answer would be play. It's like less wish work. I don't want to say less work because you're still participating in a game and you're still having to know rules and mechanics and all that stuff. But I don't know. I feel the same way where it's like, I would rather play. I would rather play at this point because I have... I love this game so much and I have gotten to play like, like Molly Ostratag ran a campaign that I got to run from beginning to end in my heart of hearts. There's that idea of like, what if I got to be a hero in one of those campaigns that goes for session after session after session. And it's a regular game and you level up and you get to be the hero and you, you know, you get to 20th level and you why like i i got to 20th level oh my god like that would be it's just an experience like i've done so much in dnd and i've never gotten to do that but i would be lying if i didn't say that dming is tremendously fun and also if it was one of those things where there is so much pressure on people to dm if that's something that they do that it's sort of the, the world is so lopsided that like the supply and demand are so neck and neck. But I bet if we were in a world where tons of people wanted to DM, I would probably be one of those people fighting to DM still. Like I do love it. And it's something that I think I love and I have an affinity for and it satiates a creative impulse in me. So I think that if we lived in a different world where it was more common for people to be like bucking to DM and it was like, oh, if you get a chance to DM, that's rare. I probably would be fighting for it more. But because we live in the world where people are desperate for people to run games, I have never felt an absence of opportunity to get to do this thing that I love. Does that make sense? Is that... Is that Yes, I believe so. I'm organizing it in my brain right now, and I got it. Yes, it makes sense to me. I'll let the listeners succinct it. I'm not. I'm not covering for the fact that I didn't paraphrase <laughs> it right. In my head. No, I, I. I get it. It's like for me too. It's like I definitely feel the crave to DM. There's something satisfying about being in that role where you kind of get to be the leader of this really cool, like the orchestrator of a story, you know, and that's really satisfying. But I really love being a player because that same reason. It's like, I would like to be the hero. I would like to have these amazing stories about me or my character, I should say. And I get it. So let me kind of transition us now because I'm interested in... We've seen over the last, I don't know, a handful of years, maybe five, seven years, where actual plays are becoming more and more prevalent as a media. You know, like it's it's a huge thing. I mean, even your show, right? Dimension 20 on College Humor. And I want to get, talk a little bit about how we transition from GMing at a home game into like now this world where actual plays exist and GMing plus production because I'm sure there's a huge kind of difference in that um so I'm interested in that especially since I've been doing some actual plays myself so first off let's get into Dimension 20 a little bit could you talk to me about like what is Dimension 20? Dimension 20 is an anthology D&D actual play show starring a cast of comedians produced by College Humor we have short seasons of episodes, usually 18-ish episodes in our full seasons. Episodes are about two hours in length, in which we tell full stories set in different universes, all inherently comedic. We had High School for Heroes Teen Adventurers. We have a setting in an urban fantasy version of New York City. We had one that was a mashup of Game of Thrones and Candyland, right? So it's like comedic premises played straight with a lot of heart by a group of comedians, high production value, filmed and edited, actual play. 
Okay, so how did it get started? I was working as a question writer for a game show at College Humor called Um Actually, as they were getting ready to launch their streaming platform, Dropout. I got brought on as a full cast member during the time period where they were looking for different forms of long form content for the streaming platform. I was a huge fan of all different kinds of actual play. I'd been playing D&D since I was 10 years old. And actual play seemed like something right up the alley of college humor, being that it's a relatively inexpensive way to produce a lot of content with great people that features an element of college humor's tradition, which is the vibe of our hardly working videos of hanging with the cast, right? So I was writing up a treatise. I was talking about all of my like market research, talking about like, oh, here's what the people at Critical Role are doing and it's awesome. Here's what the people at the Adventure Zone are doing and it's awesome. And as I was working on it, I got called into our head of development's office, this guy named Adam Frucci. And he said, Brandon, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Put down whatever you're doing. We want to talk to you about an actual play show. And I went, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. So, you know, a little bit of clearly in the zeitgeist, right? And we jumped into it and basically looking at the marketplace for what existed at that time, we had a couple of things that we knew were a reality. We knew we were going to be a behind, a behind a paywall and we were going to be video on demand, right? Which meant that we knew we were going to be pre-taped. So we weren't going to be doing live streaming. So immediately we went like, okay, that's a limitation because when you live stream, you develop community really easily. They're in the chat. It's a weekly event. It's live. There's a thrill to it, right? So we went, okay, how do we make up for the fact that we're pre-taped? And we said, we're going to hire Rick Perry. We're going to have Michael Schaubach. We're going to have Santi, uh, Kenny Keeler. We're going to have uh, the whole squad of our minis makers and set makers. So it's going to be super glossy, high octane, awesome battle sets, right? And so Dimension 20 And then we went, we're going to do these sort of limited run seasons. They're going to be a little bit more, like the episode length is going to be two hours or two hours and a half. And so we developed this thing to kind of be like production value, battle sets, miniatures, you know, come on behind the paywall. It's funny. It's comedians playing that. So that was sort of our offering because I think in actual play, the space is so friendly. And even between different companies, there's so much crossover and mutual aid. And again, in in something like actual play that is a having a renaissance, your competitors are not your fellow actual play creators. Your competitors are watching more Great British Bake Off on Netflix. Me and Matt Mercer and the McElroys and uh, the NADPOD people and Rivals of Waterdeep and uh, Into the Motherlands, all these awesome streams, we're all like like hugging each other and holding hands and being like, hey, when people discover one of our shows, they often go discover the others, right? So like this is real, there's a lot of mutual benefit here. So for us, creating Dimension 20 was about going like, here's this awesome potluck we see that people brought chili. We see that people brought, uh, there's a great punch bowl over here. Did people bring a dessert dish? Did people bring this other thing? And so that's what Dimension 20 kind of was, was us seeing like, everyone's doing awesome stuff in this space already. What can we bring that will be complimentary and different? Sure. I mean, for me, I found out about Dimension 20 because of Pirates of Leviathan. And when some of the cast that I already followed was on that show I was like oh shoot like Carlos Luna who I think is a fantastic player like love all the things that Carlos is doing I was like oh that's a really cool show and I do like you're you're saying when one actual play comes up I know NADPOD as well and so yeah it's like it's really nice to see all these shows just being like yeah celebrating each other and then getting guests on and people from other th- shows to to come on and play so that's kind of like where the the next line i was going to ask uh you about gming for production so question the actual first of this line of thought of mine i don't know is there a difference i mean there's obviously a difference in choosing players for a non-content home game versus a like this is an actual play oh certainly yeah In in terms of casting yeah i mean like I love playing with every kind of person under the sun. Like if I'm playing a home game, truly like the the only standard I have to play a home game with someone is if they are a nice and sweet person that I would want to spend time with. That's the that's the only bar we're clearing for home game is are you nice? Are you a good-hearted person? Um 
for actual play, yeah, I think you're looking for, for performance background, right? You are looking like, because that's, that's the interesting element of actual play is yes, it's D and D we are playing a game, but I think that you are looking for people that have an improv background. You're looking for people that do voice work, even just people who have that camera awareness of knowing that because the thing that is the difference between a home game and an actual play is there are things that are really fun in a home game that are not fun to an audience. As a player, us having a battle in which it's very clear from the outset that we're going to win and, uh, and we're just using our abilities to just absolutely house a group of monsters, incredibly enjoyable. Oh, how wonderful to just succeed. For a viewer, not so much, right? We want to feel danger. We want to feel drama. Like there are a lot of things that change. And so I think that in addition to classical performance skills, you also need kind of classical writing skills. You need people that it's not that they're being false, but you need people whose natural inclinations lend themselves towards big choices that are rewarding for people watching the game. There are a lot of, and again, because I think that it's really fun to role play a character consistently. Look, there are ways of getting that dopamine, getting that serotonin when you're playing a character that aren't necessarily telegenic. I make a choice that feels really in character. I feel cool about that, even if it didn't spur the story on. But when you're doing actual play, you know, I kind of need to serve two masters here. I need to do stuff that I like, and I need to do stuff that is going to be fun and engaging and exciting for an audience at home, for sure. So I think it's very different. Yes, I was going to say, and I think the things that are still probably important for the the production side is, you know, sweet, nice people and the people who have like good chemistry together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say, is like, is that something you take into consideration too in choosing your cast? I think so. Well, and I, and I, yeah, I think we definitely take chemistry into consideration, which is of course a very challenging thing to do because it's, articulating that is very difficult to be like what like how how well do you really know these performers to know who is going to gel together or not do you guys typically have like a sort of in game term session zeros or like sit down meet talk kind of get into what we're making yeah, I think we, we do. We have character creation and then we'll usually have what we you know like like a, a kind of gelling session, a kind of like a, a chemistry session or, or whatever you want to call it of like, hey, let's get to know each other. That's actually something, something that I will say here too, is that I don't know how much I buy that chemistry is an innate component of people. I think that chemistry might be like 25% inborn temperament and then 75% getting on rhythm together. Like, I think that chemistry can actually be forged, like, can be built, right? I, so I really do believe that. Uh, you know, maybe you never overcome that last 25% if people just have very different styles or very different whatever. Really what a great performer has, I think, is a desire to play with other people. And so the best performers do have an internal style, but also know how to adapt their style to accommodate other people. So I think that when you're playing with real professionals and people that are really, really brilliant, you are often seeing that like any chemistry can work because part of this person's internal ideology is making the players around them comfortable. Right, that give and take, like being aware of the table at large and knowing what to contribute to the table to uplift the whole thing is very important. Yeah. I think that's good for home, like just in my own general experiences, like getting home game stuff too. It's like you want to kind of have those people who are team players. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think, again, there's a certain kind of Again, I have been very fortunate to mention 20 because truly we, everyone we've ever played with on the show has been someone who I am staggered with respect and admiration for. It's, it is a true 
unbelievable good fortune to have played with the casts that we've played with. But what I would say there too is that every single member of those casts, I think you could actually kind of put them together in any constellation because those people all are of that top tier caliber where they go like, oh yeah, I have a very distinctive style, but like the moment I sense that something I'm doing at the table is not someone's cup of tea, watch me clock that right away and change course. And so you do have people that just move in beautiful configuration with each other in that way. You know, like I have things that I like to do in games, but you got to be a chameleon. The way I'm going to play D&D if I'm teaching a group of like elementary school kids how to go on their first adventure is going to be very different than how I play with my family when I'm home for the holidays or my 10 year long home game or a group of professional improvisers when we're doing Dimension 20. Like that adaptability, I think, does a lot for the idea of chemistry. Sure, sure. I get it. Yeah. So we have your show. Uh, we have the idea of Dimension 20. You've got your players now. So I'm interested in you, Brennan, as a GM preparing this show, which uh, you said you have a main show and then there's also side quests, like a main campaign and then side yeah. stuff. Whew. Tell me about that because yeah. it's making my GM brain go, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we've done like eight seasons of the show oh, wow. in two years. Yeah, oh. it's it, it's like, I forget. We tell you, we, we, we've made a lot. We've made a lot. We have made a lot of the show. Yeah, you're not wrong. If I correctly understand your question to, to be, that seems like a lot of work. Is that a lot of work? The answer to that question would be, hey, Amber, yeah, that is a lot of work. Um, joyful, soul-affirming work, but boy, howdy, is it? Yes, there's a lot. And it is your job, correct? Correct. Yes, it is It is my, my full-time employment at College Humor to produce and create and run Dimension Living 20. The dream. <laughs> no kidding. I'm I very agree. happy for you that you were able to find this. This is awesome. So prep for not production is everybody has their own way of doing it. Everybody has their certain levels, whatever. For you specifically, prep for something that is non-produced versus prep for something that is produced, has there been a shift in your mentality of how you do it? Is it different? Is it harder? Is it, what, what is the shape of this prep now? I think I have gotten to the point now where I realize how little you really need to have a session work. The skills you acquire over time, my ability to not have to railroad because I've gotten better at guessing what my PCs are probably going to do, the ability to know that a handful of place names, a handful of NPC names, one or two scene ideas is going to flesh out an entire city. You go like, what does someone really encounter where, where you, you realize how much the PCs fill in the gaps in Gestalt space. If I can narrate what the city looks like as you sail to it in the morning light into the harbor and see it come to life around you, I can narrate a couple visual details of the open air bazaar that you walk through as you go through there. You tell me, what's, what are you going to look for? Probably a tavern, probably an inn. I say, oh, give me a roll. You roll. I go to my list of two or three inn names because how many inns are you going to stay in? It's not going to be four. And realizing how to work smarter, realizing that you can make a couple of tools for yourself ahead of time to give yourself to, to kind of click into a mental state where you feel familiar with your setting and then you improvise. I've gotten better at going, cool, you're in a city with mostly humanoids. I don't need to come up with monster stat blocks. What's going to happen is you're going to tell me who you're fighting, 
and I'm going to scoot online. And if they're schmoes, I'm going to go use the bandit stat block. If they're tougher schmoes, I'm going to use bandits with a few more hit points. And if they're, you know what I mean? Like you just get better about going, I don't need hours or days of planning. A, because I don't have it. I just don't have that. I don't have that luxury. And most people don't that are GMing, that, that are like working a full-time job or doing this as a hobby. Uh, so, you know, if you're listening to this, I would say like it's better to, to bulk up your muscles around what are the actual essential pieces of prep work that I need to then be able to 80% improvise with. You know, that kind of thing of like, teach a man to fish, you know, uh, give a man a fish, eat it feeds for a day, teach a man to fish. It's that idea of, of sort of like, if you're doing this, the, the process of like, I'm going to make every single neighborhood in my city with every single like place name and, and dozens of NPCs and all this stuff, that's groovy. You're not going to get a return on investment on all of that effort. They're not going to meet 60 NPCs in this city. They're going to meet five, eight and they're going to meet one of those eight that they're going to fall in love with, and it's going to be the only person they want to talk to. So, like, so don't make 40. Don't do that. It's, it's not your, your, it's going to be frustrating for you in the end. That's where I've got to do with my prep work is about working smarter and knowing that I can rely on improv in a lot of places. But again, with Dimension 20, there's not a lot of analog within Dimension 20 for prep because most people are not uh like in your home game you are not getting emails from rick perry about the timeline for when sets need to get delivered by so like all the production elements of dimension 20 make prep work sort of what like the actual preparatory process for dimension 20 is completely backwards in terms of what people need to do for their home games in dimension 20 I make the bare bones of a world, usually the, the week or the week after I make it, we develop PCs with our core cast members. And right after that, I completely skip any more world design and go into battle set design with Rick Perry because that needs several months of lead in to be able to deliver them in time. And so usually, it's actually battle sets coming first and then I'm kind of connect the dotsing of storyline as we are coming up with the battle sets. So there's not a lot of, I feel like, <laughs> practical advice in the Dimension 20 method for people playing home games. Well, no, no, no. I, I think it's it's because I've seen these sets and that's why I wanted to ask this question yeah. because I was like, holy moly, who is making these? This is amazing. They are beautiful. And so in my mind, immediately went to GMing and I was like, how far out did he think of these areas? And then it's, well, no, not that much <laughs> because I don't really have the time to do that. So that's really cool because I, I, I'm, I'm also asking this from a production standpoint because I want people to understand how much, what that's like, like behind the scenes of you see this all come together. I'm, I'm always fascinated about how, why things happen the way they happen so that's really fascinating but is it kind of nice though to have i think it would be fantastic people have these sets in front of me as a gm and then be able to make stuff up like get inspired by it well that was a funny thing that me and rick perry rick is a genius and he's one of the best collaborators i've ever worked with and when he realized that it's actually easier for me if he just makes a bunch of minis and then i will create characters around them because, you know, usually, because usually when we're beginning the process, I am still deeply ensconced in the post-production process for a previous season of the show. So we're like designing music soundscapes, we're like reviewing episodes, we're noting things, we're cutting things, we're editing things. And then it's like, no, no, we got to make the next one. We got to make the next season. And Rick's like, cool. What do you, it, so, so it'll be, a, you know, I'll be like crafting a world and Rick will be like, how many different kinds of ty like types of orcs do we need here? And it'll be like, Rick, I, I just got here. You're like, I do like, and it'll be like, make a bunch and we'll use, we'll use them. You know, like, 
which is, I'm sure, very frustrating to Rick, who comes from a traditional production designer background in film and television. But when he realized that, like, actually, he can, like, totally go to bat and create a bunch of minis and create extras and all this stuff like that, and I'll incorporate them, and that's actually an easier way for me to work, because I think that everyone can feel that panic attack of, if I looked at you right now and I was like, Amber, you have 10 minutes to come up with a setting, and then I'm going to need a list of who you anticipate being in every location in the setting two and a half months from now. It's like, I would fart noises, <laughs> <laughs> just lots of fart. <laughs> uh, I uh, no, I can't do that. It's easier for me. I would say what you said. Just make a bunch of things, and I will put a voice to them. Don't worry about it. If they've got a corn cob pipe, I'll make it work. Have fun, Rick. A hundred percent. And so that's a lot of what we do uh, uh, is this like mutual collaboration as the battle sets are getting designed of then figuring out the plot based on the battle sets and figuring out where we're going to go based on whatever else, uh, which is rad as hell. That's awesome. So another question I have, you know, talking a little bit about prep and stuff. And earlier you had mentioned something about like what's fun to uh, the home game would not be necessarily fun for the audience. So combat in D&D has sort of this rep of being long, especially as you add more players to it and i think you have about six people yeah, six, for each uh, game six players yeah so i haven't gotten to a combat yet in dimension 20 so i haven't seen it do you do stuff differently for combat prepping for it to help maybe with that ease of like it being a quote-unquote slog uh yes we try to always every battle we try to find a gimmick for it. we try to find how is this going to be different mechanics wise from other battles in the season adding environmental effects adding terrains and material circumstances that provide creative player choices interactivity uh, often like having other non-combat related tasks like yes you're trying to beat your opponents you're also trying to not fall into lava you're also trying to wrest control of this orb away from other people you're also trying we had a battle in the unsleeping city season one spoilers for that of uh there was a fight that occurred during a Broadway show where they had to keep making performance checks to not alert the audience to the fact that true arcane violence was occurring on stage. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, man. very, very fun, right? Uh, and again, just adding a lot of narrative tapestry, right? Trying to avoid those turns where it's like, you get an 18, you do 12 points of damage moving on. But really being like, okay, resolve that role. What does that mean narratively? Bada boom, bada bam. Involving a lot of banter. And if possible, and some, obviously this can't happen in every single battle, but where possible, having plot unfold during battles. Having characters arrive mid-combat that are sudden reveals of a new villain or a new plot element. Having something occur, you know, if people hit important nat 20s, having moments of catharsis or character development occur during combat. You know, like uh, a wild magic surge that prompts some new revelation about the cosmology of the setting uh, during a combat session. So I think the real trick with combat sessions for us is A, making them mechanically interesting and trying to find ways to do that. And then B, remembering that we are still trying to advance the story while the combat is occurring. Your sessions are about two hours long is what mm -hmm. you said, two hours. Do you typically have it set where you have one combat per session or do you know that this is going to be a combat episode or the first half is going to be a combat or is that just, again, kind of improvised for most of our core seasons we alternate so it's role play combat role play combat role play combat role play combat uh, and again a lot of that is because we need to pre-make the sets so you know if i it's it's a big deal if we don't get to a combat set because that's a lot of time and money and company effort that has gone into creating an asset that we need to use however with our live season that ratio changed up dramatically where there were some combats that were like 15 minutes, like a character dispatches a guard somewhere. For other things, it's like, and also we would have multiple episodes in a row that were just role-playing episodes, and then combats would take as long as they needed to take. The live season that we did on Twitch was just much more organic. Uh, and then this season of The Unsleeping City, we moved to a Roll20 format and just ended up, as a result of that, dispatching the that format. So now, 
it's loosely like a combat every other episode, but with some exceptions. Sometimes we do two role playings in a row and then a combat. Other times we might, you know, so it, it varies. I'm interested, again, going back to this multi-setting story, I guess. is it Are they interconnected or do they all just kind of exist in their own pocket? Is it the same realm, your main story and the other ones? We do have fans that have done like a Pixar style theory of like all Pixar movies occur in the same universe. However, the the nice thing for fans of the show that, or people that want to come check the show out is they really are nicely hermetically sealed. So we do have follow-up seasons. So Fantasy High, our very first season of the show, did have a sequel season in Dimension 20 Live. So we did a, a special season live streamed on Twitch where it was theater of the mind and it was the core cast coming back. So, so, and that's called sophomore year. So it's fantasy high sophomore year. So that is a, is a sequel season. And we are now doing the unsleeping city chapter two, which is clearly a sequel season to the first unsleeping city, but otherwise a crown of candy is its own world as well. So is blood keep. So is tiny heist. Pirates of Leviathan is interesting because it does take place in the world of Fantasy High, but is in a different part of the setting focusing on an unrelated storyline. So that gets a little bit more MCU-esque where it's like, no, you don't have to have watched the other thing to enjoy this, but there will be some delightful references and Easter eggs for those who So then I would like to know, is this your brain baby? This idea, this multi-dimensional sort of setting, genre hopping is that was that all you i actually so i think this was actually originally the decision of the people that were running dropout at that time so what's interesting about this is it comes down to the difference in production between podcasts streams and what dropout was creating at the time so at the time dropout was working like a classical entertainment production company which means that they had cycles and production slates for shows. And at that time, I do not believe that there was a way for Dropout to ingest the idea of an ongoing show. So for them, it was like, we need to think of this as being seasons. We need to think of this as being seasons of a show that we can commence, hire a producer for, shoot, edit, and release. And so the anthology element I think came about as part of that, that was a just sort of a, a creative decision that was handed down to me from the people that were running Dropout at the time. Because obviously looking at like, you know, the balance arc of the Adventure Zone or looking at like, you know, Critical Role Campaign 1, in my head, I was sort of like, hey, these things can go on kind of ad infinitum. And I forget what the reasoning was for why they wanted to do anthology. But anthology they did i mean it's a great choice for keeping fans and like that longevity because like you said you brought up crook roll and the adventure zone i as a listener of at least the venture zone it's like having that same cast over and over again you get to grow to feel connected ish to them you know like you're fans of not only the players but the characters and the whole story so an anthology is like a good <laughs> idea i think to keep that going just as a as a uh, you know, consumer I hear, you. and of course, the funny thing is that these is that these other shows are now kind of anthology shows. Like Adventure Zone has done a bunch of settings and even different systems by this point. So over an appropriate length of time, every show becomes an anthology show. Like even Critical Role, like the the, the titans of long form storytelling, they're in their second campaign right now. You know, so it's sort of like you do end up doing an anthology either over the short or the long scale. So I would like to know, like everybody usually gets their inspiration from other medias, other things that they enjoy. So Brennan, what is inspiring for you when you do GMing for games and stuff, even production or not? Whoa, what is inspiring for me, productions or otherwise? All of it. I know that's such a cliche answer, but all of it. There's there's really nothing that can't make its way into a fun idea. Like, I, you know, at this point, over two thirds of my life have been running constant D and D. It's my favorite books. It's you know, I like, I as a kid consumed the entire canon of like the classical what you would think of as like the classical fantasy novels, and then a bunch that fall well outside the canon and are weirder and more outlandish. 
graphic novels, comic books, TV shows, cartoons, movies, film, television, uh, you know, like, and that's the thing is, is in terms of genre bending, it's like, yeah, like I have, you know, read Lord of the Rings multiple times. I know, I know the canon of like fantasy genre fiction, but like, my long running campaign when I was in college was Storm City, which I'm going to point to what a bigger influence between Lord of the Rings or Casablanca or Lord of the Rings and The Wire. It's probably those other two, right? Even though they're not fantasy storytelling. I'll read an article about some weird portion of biology or physics and it will get translated into some magical item, some diabolical group of strange otherworldly old one warlocks. So to me, inspiration is unavoidable. A couple times a day I space out based on some bizarre stimulus and end up thinking about how that could relate to dragons in some so way. So walking or around your house and then just stop in the middle of your room, staring. <laughs> you're describing what happens. That's, you're not, every, my partner Izzy will come into the room and I will, and I will come out of a fugue state, like, you know, Dr. Strange coming out of the astral realm and look at my partner just like waving in my face, being like, hello, hi. What you doing? Oh, thinking about games again. Okay, bye. <laughs> That's great. So from 10 years old to now, I want to know maybe some of your favorite proudest moments in GMing. One as maybe 10 year old Brennan, Making you go back, getting you in that time machine. We'll do 10-year-old first because I love hearing what kids were coming up with because kid imagination is fantastic. So funny. The first session of D&D I ever ran was so horrendously bad. I had all of my friends there and they all made characters that were... I don't need, I don't know that I need to describe what a 10 year old boy is to your listeners, but all you know about what a 10 year old boy is, is that every 10 year old boy's first D and D character is I'm Damien Darkblade, the dark master ranger. I'm a ranger anti paladin and I have 20 swords. <laughs> um, just a gang of murderous, amoral, uh, assassins. I constructed an adventure about a evil sorcerer who was a misunderstood villain who had a tragic backstory. And all the PCs needed to do was, I think, like reach out to this dark sorcerer in understanding. And I made him completely invincible unless you had learned about and cared about his tragic backstory. Let me tell you, this table full of seven rowdy 10 year olds hopped up on root beer, greasy with pizza. Um, they saw the sorcerer and I literally think I said it at some point, like you see a tragic portrait of him on the wall. And they were like, we burn it. <laughs> We burn it. We don't care. Uh, so I killed all of them and everyone got mad at me. And I said, I said, too bad. You all lose. And then everyone went home and I looked at my mom and I said, mom, this was the most stressful day of my life. I was a 10 year old and I was talking about stress. It's like, this is, a stre this is the most stressful day of my life. And she said, oh, sweetie, I'm so sorry. And the very next thing I said was, can we call everyone's uh, moms and dads and try to schedule a session for next week? And so the lesson there is if you are doing this and you are not living up to your standards for yourself, have the foolhardy and unmitigated resolve of a 10 year old uh, of just like, man, this sucked. When can we do it? Good again? lesson. I mean, going back to harnessing that 10 year old power, it's very important. That's, that's what I've, I'm taking away from all of this. <laughs> So then my second question was like, maybe like college years, like proudest GM moment. Can we do it? Yeah. So that was when I was running Storm City. That was when I was running Storm City. And um, God, I'm trying to, it's so funny. I don't have any memories of stuff that I've done. Like you're asking me to remember D&D &D, and I only remember the stuff my players did. 
I guess this is, is this is a successful GM thing because so so horror can be hard to pull off in D&D because player characters are so capable. They have so many powers and features and abilities. I got to a moment where my two PCs, one of which was played by, by my brother, Griffin Johnston, who's my best friend in the world and I love him with all my heart. And my one of my other best friends in the world who I love with my whole heart, Connor Gillespie, who I've talked about many times. Connor Gillespie, also the, the eponymous Owen of St. Owen's Hospital, which appears in many different D20 settings. So Connor and Griffin are playing these two characters. They're playing a wizard in a setting where magic is illegal and his monk bodyguard who has just signed on. And they've been unraveling this conspiracy this, that has to do with vampires living in this city where there's 20 hours of night every day. And Connor and them suddenly come into this realization that all of the close family members of Griffin's player, Edmund Thrent, are vampires. So like they've been rooting around doing like their amateur low level vampire hunting and now realize that every, that not only that they thought they were safe in their home because vampires could only come where invited and realize the owner of the palace they're staying in is a vampire and all his men at arms and servants are vampires. And the degree of panic that set it on their face resulted in one of my favorite quotes of all time. Back when like, Facebook quotes were a thing, my entire quote wall on Facebook was just Storm City quotes of my hilarious, wonderful friends. And their conspirator like, my God, we're surrounded by vampires. There's vampires on all sides. What are we going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? We don't have to know. We have to leave right now. And they're like, leave where? All the city's crawling with vampires. There's nowhere to go. And then I say, roll a spot check back in 3.5 they roll hit it and they have discovered my friends sh my friend shelby's character who's another pc that i want to loop in to become an ally of theirs is on a balcony right underneath them and has heard everything they've said and griffin without hesitation gets that information from me and turns and grabs connor in real life in this little basement with snacks and soda and everywhere he grabs him and goes my God, she's heard everything. We need to kill her and then kill ourselves. And it <laughs> made me laugh. Heart. Just the quote, my God, she's heard everything. We must kill her and then kill ourselves. Is That's fantastic. Oh my God. I can just feel that. Is there if I share something with you? Because it's, it's, yes, please. It's, please, please, please. it's the same thing. It's in my 20s and I'm a player. And funnily enough, it has to do with vampires too, where we're going to this gala. And they ask, you know, you come to the door and they're like doing the classic vampire thing. May I come in? And we're like, okay, yeah, come in. We're, there's a little party going on. We go into a room. All the mirrors on this house have been taken off. These details of the GM's dropping. And it wasn't until like we realized we're like, vampires. We're surrounded. We're surrounded by vampires. I think it's so good. So shout out to my GM, Josh, for that. Dear God, you both of you, same, same wavelength. Boom, there it is, on the same vibration. Vampires. <laughs> okay, so uh, last question, third question. Proudest moment in Dimension 20 as a GM? And it can be GM-related, or it can be production-related, or something you're just, like, really, like, happy that happened. Proudest moment as a GM. Dimension 20. Okay, here's something I did that was good. This is, it's very, again, just, the reason these questions are so difficult is that I truly believe that being a dungeon master is a service position. The story's about the PCs. And that's not even, that's not like a revelation. That's like how the game works. Like you, you don't, you don't follow NPCs when they leave the room where the players are. Almost everything that's a successful DM moment is a moment where you set up a player to look awesome. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, which is why, which is why having like a highlights reel as a DM is kind of like a hard thing to do. It's like when people talk about editors in film and television, where it's like the best editing is hard to notice because the best editing is about being seamless, is about like, is about making something like silky smooth and it just flows, and it's like, oh, I wouldn't have thought to like notice it necessarily. Be like it, it, that. I think that's what good DMing. Good DMing can be hard to spot in that way a lot of times, I think. 
And again, some people might disagree. Like the things that people tend to compliment about DMing, like, where they're like, oh, you do voices or whatever. It's like, cool. Yes, that's like, I am glad to provide that entertainment value to people, but that's not the moments that I would necessarily be like proud of uh, because that's not, I think, the focal point. The only thing I can think of to satisfy the question in Dimension 20 that I think is a, is a real thing, spoilers for episode, for the end of episode two, Fantasy High. I don't even want to say it. I will say the entire first season of Fantasy High is available on YouTube, Dimension 20. At the end of episode two of Fantasy High, a situation had occurred that I thought had the potential to ruin the show. To, to like something occurred as a nature of like improv and the mechanics of D&D that I was suddenly faced with like, if I don't find a way to wriggle my way out of this, like the two, the two biggest options here for what I can do are both bad. If I go option A, show is irrevocably changed in a harmful way, oh no. If I go option B, I lose integrity, credibility. Like we can't just redline what happened in other words. So I have to find a way to do C and I have no idea what C is and the cameras are rolling. And I think I was able to find C. I think I was able to find a way through improv of satisfying every consideration at the table and doing something totally unexpected that allowed the show to even move forward at all. When it was my first day of filming this show, first day of being an actual play dungeon master, and my like whole job at College Humor was riding on the line. That sounds stressful, but I am so proud of you. Congratulations. Hey, thank Good you. job. I That's amazing. It. Yes. I appreciate it. Uh, and I appreciate that you came on to talk with me. This has been awesome. A delight, an honor, a pleasure, and a joy. So, Brennan, if people want to find you and all the stuff that you do, where can they do that? You can find me, uh, so Dimension 20, we have new episodes airing every Wednesday, uh, dropout.tv, go ahead and sign up for Dropout, you can get a free trial, come check us out. Um, you can also find free seasons of the show uh, on our YouTube, uh, Dimension 20. And you can find my personal stuff at Brennan LM on Twitter and at Brennan Lee Mulligan on Instagram. Thanks again for coming on. This was awesome. I will try d and I will try to run it. I will try it. You're, I bet you will kick ass at it. And you'll probably kick ass at it whether uh, uh, it, it suits you or not because you're rad as hell. So go kick <laughs> a bunch of ass and then like decide if it's for you. You know what I yep, mean? I will do that. Hell yeah. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Real quick before we go into our normal end of the show role, I just wanted to throw it out there that I, Amber, have an enamel pin Kickstarter currently running until January 15th of 2021. If you or someone you know likes enamel pins plus Magic the Gathering cross with Magical Girl anime aesthetic, please check it out. You can find it on my Twitter at Rocket Orca or by searching Magical Lands on Kickstarter. On Twitter, you can also find the other co-hosts of this show, Kenny is at Wolfmere and John is at Crossways GM. Tabletop Babble is part of the Geekspective network. Go to geekspective.com to check out all our other shows or follow us on Twitter at Geekspective. Our theme music was provided by the Battle Bards. Hero Forge offers fully customizable tabletop miniatures with dozens of fantasy races and thousands of parts to choose from. Their easy-to-use design tool lets you build your perfect miniature online using a fully 3D in-depth character creator right in your web browser. Custom minis can be made in a variety of materials, including plastic and metal options. They also offer downloadable model files so you can 3D print your own unique designs at home. Hero Forge is constantly expanding their catalog of customization options, adding new parts every week and major features like races and custom posing on a regular basis. Visit HeroForge.com to start designing your custom miniature today. And check back often, new content is added every week.